Hi, everybody. My name is Kinsley Stokum, and I'll be helping Sherry out with the webinar today. We'd like to welcome everybody. Um, we really appreciate you spending some time with us. I'd just like to let everybody know that you're automatically muted to help keep the background noise to a minimum, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. We typically communicate via the chat box, so type your question or comment in there, and I'll be monitoring those throughout today's presentation. We are recording it, so we will send you the link afterward, and you can watch it again later if you want. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sherry Woosley, the Director of Analytics and Research for SkyFactor. Sherry? Thanks, Kinsley. Um, again, welcome, everybody. Today we're talking about data visualizations, uh, kind of an interesting lunch conversation. Um, I was thinking about... Uh, you know, some of my very first conversations about data visualizations, which unfortunately go back a number of years. And I think they go back to that time where we used to talk about, you know, which graph to use or which type of graph, you know, should I use a pie chart or a bar chart or a line graph? And we've come so far. Um, so I, I think it's probably a, a relevant topic uh, with a long history, and it should be kind of interesting. Um, what I want to do is uh, lay just a little bit of groundwork. Why would we talk about data visualizations and what's kind of that power? And then I want to do some perspectives. And one of the reasons I want to do this is I think, you know, those early conversations were so important. That it, it is important to know that, you know, a line graph is great looks and bar charts are good for comparisons and a pie graph is good for, you know, showing parts of a whole. Um, and what I'm seeing a lot at conferences lately are more the how-to, you know, what's the best way to do a data visualization uh, using Excel or PowerPoint or Tableau or even R when you talk about research. Um, and I, I think Although those, those are really powerful and really helpful, particularly if you have a tool that you're trying to get better at, um, I, I think we need to, again, give ourselves some thinking points around data visualizations. Because we've come so far from those um, early days of which chart, and even, you know, which colors and how do you, you know, use the right colors or whatever it may be, um, I, I think... And, and so many of the sort of new books or even the new articles talk about interactive data and how do you build vi those kinds of visualizations. One of the things uh, to get good at this that we need is concepts and concepts that help us think through the decisions that we're making around data visualizations and that can be used across the different kinds of data visualizations you're doing. So whether you're doing a graph or a, a, a written report or a PowerPoint or a, or a you know an interactive data source uh, dashboards and all of that you know what are the things that we should be contemplating or thinking about or even when we're deciding which of those mechanisms to use how do we make those decisions um, because a lot of our thinking I think glosses over those basic concepts um, and sometimes bringing those to light and putting those to the forefront can help us think through things. So that's my plan, is uh, three different perspectives to kind of give you some tools with which to think through your data visualizations. Um, and having done this talk at a couple of conferences, what we find, which I think is really interesting, is that when we do this kind of talk in these three perspectives, sometimes it's just putting language around some of the conversations that we're already having, um, or maybe adding some nuance to those conversations. So hopefully nothing you see here is going to be completely new, uh, although the artist design one can get um, can push us a little bit, uh, particularly if you're sitting in that data world. It's not a perspective we necessarily um, naturally bring to this. So it should be kind of fun. I will give you concrete examples so that it's not just conceptual. Um, and yeah, should be an interesting kind of hour, although hopefully a little bit shorter. Um, I should also put out kind of a quick thank you to Matt Venice, one of my research managers, who makes my PowerPoints look fabulous. Um, I, uh, although I have kind of an artist background, um, I don't know, his selection of photos and things you will see is, is pretty stunning. So Matt Venice, research manager, awesome job. All right, so let's talk about uh, kind of why data visualizations? I think one of the big things is data overload. I don't think any of us are having uh, no data, right? Um, and if it's not data uh, overload, it's information overload. Uh, we are faced with 
so many different things that, uh, or our audiences that we're trying to communicate with uh, are facing so many different things. How do we help them make sense of things, make sense of things quickly, find the right information? And, and how do we do that so that we're not, um, for lack of a better word, torturing people or being tortured ourselves with the amount of information coming our way. Um, and, and if we can help facilitate those conversations and the thinking and, and, and move to, you know, what does that mean for the work that we do, I think it's really powerful. Um, I, don't, I don't know an institution or a campus around that um, doesn't have enough data. They might not have the data they want, but it's never a matter of we don't have any. Um, it, it's trying to find what we need and make sense of it quickly. So uh, this information overload creates an issue, and data visualizations are a tool that we're using, I think, in lots of circles to deal with that. If you think about why visual things can be uh, a powerful tool to deal with overload or information load, um, here's some numbers and some stats to kind of help you. Um, think about why you might want to go visual if you haven't gone. Uh, if, if you're still in love with charts and tons of numbers and you're debating on kind of how far to go, I mean, think about it, 65% of folks are visual learners. Um, so they are going to be kind of using their eyes rather than their ears um, to, to process kinds of these things. 50% um, of the brain is dedicated to processing visual stimulation. If you think of all of the different pieces of information that are coming in, uh, not just at the screen that you're looking at, but everything else coming in the room, there's a lot kind of going into your brain from your eyes. And 90% of the information that comes to the brain tends to be visual. Um, you know, if you think of all the different nuances and movements and, and pieces uh, that are coming in to, uh, for you to see, it's amazing. The other thing I think that's really kind of powerful when you think about it is how fast we process visual information. Um, Obviously, listening to things, we can process uh, information, but when you think about looking th at something and making sense of a picture and how fast we can make judgments about it, learn from it, um, see what's important, see what's not important, look at the whole and the little parts, uh, we're very fast at processing visuals, um, and particularly, you know, visuals compared to text. If you think about looking at a, a painting and how you process that versus how you look at a written page and how long it takes you to sort of read it, uh, particularly for those of us who maybe not are, are not speed readers. Um, and even to be a speed reader, the, the extent to which you have to train yourself to do that compared to kind of just looking at I always think of when I walk in a room and I look around a room and I make some snap judgments about uh, about tone and, and texture and culture and conversation and all of those things. That's all from visuals, um, or at least the so much of it is visuals. One of the other reasons I think that visualizing or thinking about data visualizations can be powerful is it is a mechanism for storytelling. And it's tight, and it can be tightly linked to storytelling. Um, if you think about some of your best stories in terms of movies or television shows or uh, those kinds of pieces, that there's a clear connection between um, good visualizations, really strong visualizations in storytelling. Um, and there can be, and there probably should be. Um, and I don't know how much we think about a chart as storytelling, but yet, in essence, um, it can be a, a, a solid link to do. And the reason that that is helpful is that you know, storytelling kind of expands some of our common language, our, our common notions about what's going on. Um, and so by using visualization and combining visualization with storytelling, we can build on that common language, those common values, those common uh, kind of understandings of things. Um, storytelling by its very nature, uh, really good stories evoke a response, often an emotional response, because we remember emotions oftentimes longer. They kind of tickle our brains in ways that sometimes very logical things do not. And so if we can create an image that creates a story and evokes a response, the likelihood of retaining that information is stronger. 
sometimes to um, visualizing and storytelling can create new ways to see familiar things. So it may be a similar message or a similar kind of piece of information that we've heard before, but it now strikes us in a different way. We understand it differently. We see it differently. It grabs our attention because it's a kind of a new way um, and may stick with us. And visual storytelling provide ways to interpret new situations and new events. We may have a story from before that we bring to this new set uh, in assessment situations to this new set of data. And so by linking to stories, we can make that kind of processing of the new data uh, faster and easier for people. So I think there's some really clear links, and I think if we think about data visualization from kind of this storytelling lens, who's our audience and what story are we trying to communicate, that can help guide our data visualization decisions. So if you weren't on board before, hopefully you are now. Let's talk about these uh, three different kinds of concepts or perspectives or tools with which to evaluate. Um, and the first one, and I'll give you some of the references for some of this, uh, so that if you need it, you've got it. But right now, what I want to do is sort of talk conceptually um, so that you're, I don't know, thinking and thinking about how you share data and how you maybe share assessment results. Um, and the first one is this kind of spectrum. We were reading about different kinds of visuals, and I was struck by over the last five, I don't know, even 10 years, people have really started talking about interactive data. And I think because the tools have finally come along that interactive data doesn't always require, I don't know, the level of engineering skill or computer programming skill that it did 10 years ago. And as those tools have come along, the conversations have come along and to really focus on interactive data and let's move everything to these interactive data sources that let people play with interactive data and how do we visualize it so they can play and they can process. But this spectrum perspective basically says that for data visualizations, there is that exploration side of things, maybe that we didn't talk about, uh, you know, 20 years ago when everything had to be on paper. Um, but that's only one side of the spectrum. There's also an explanation spectrum. And I like this idea of spectrum because I think there's a lot of places on here that we can choose. And so one of the things to be thinking about as you think about data visualizations, even just sharing data and reporting on data, is thinking about where on the spectrum you want to fall in terms of this particular audience. How much and like where do you want to tell given the story that you want to provide, but also then where does your audience want to be? How much does your audience want to explore and play and ask its own questions? And how much, frankly, do they want you to tell them what it means? Right? How much do you want to guide them through the data um, versus, I don't know, going back and forth? So let me give you a little more depth on this. If you think about it, if you're choosing a data visualization that is focused more on the exploration side of the spectrum, then you want to provide kind of that interactive piece that enables them to do analysis. Now, I have to say exploration doesn't necessarily have to be an interactive online data source. There are ways to enable analysis through kinds of different kinds of reports and different kinds of pieces. But the idea on the exploration side of this spectrum is to let the audience member who comes at whatever data visualization you have um, ask questions of it so that they can look for the things that they're interested in. So on that side of the spectrum, you're going to often provide lots of data because they're going to come at it with their own questions. It is also going to focus on trends and patterns so people can start asking those kinds of questions and it in essence lets the audience discover the story they want. So it, it may be, frankly, a full report with different sections. You can go to different sections and find different things. But it's a matter of providing people with lots so they can find and answer the questions they want to answer. If you think about that uh, spectrum and you think about the explanation side, on the explanation side, you may have done a whole lot of analysis ahead of time and started to lay out the story for people. And so you maybe not show them all of the analysis 
all of the data. Instead, you start to edit and curate the data so that you can frame up a clearer story and, and kind of walk people through that story. Um, no matter how complicated or how simple that story is. And that in essence, when you hit that side of the spectrum, you're telling the story to the audience. Maybe with the audience, but, but in essence you've kind of, I like the word curate, you've curated the data, you've found the things that are most meaningful, most valuable for the work, most valuable for the audience, and, and you've kind of laid it out. I don't mean to say when we look at the spectrum that explanation is the marketing side that you're cherry picking. It, it can be very um, deliberate in terms of exploring all the data, but in essence you're doing the work for the audience so that when the audience comes to it, you say, you know, and you can go as far away on that spectrum as you want. If you go way far out, you might say these are the top three priorities based on all that we know. You might kind of pull it in a little towards the middle and say, you know, kind of walk them through, this is what we found, this is what it means, this is what we're going to do next. So you can kind of give as much or as little of the data and the analysis as is appropriate for your audience and your story. Because think about it, not all audiences have the time, inclination, or interest in data. And some audiences have lots of time, inclination, and interest in the data. So part of this spectrum is that. Everybody get that? It's kind of an interesting kind of idea. Let me show you um, an example which I think is kind of interesting. And I saw Steve present this. This comes from Steve Gronke at IUPUI. He's in uh, their institutional research office. But IUPUI has been putting some things on the web and allowing folks to do more of the exploration. Um, and they've got some that is open to the public, and I think that's the screen we're showing you. They've got some other things that are kind of behind some walls. But I think it's interesting. It's sort of that quintessential, here's the dashboard of data, and you can start picking, and you can pick different campuses, different schools. Maybe you want to look at gender or race or tuition or different program levels. You can ask the system what questions you want to ask. So you can do the exploration. Well, it was really interesting when he gave this presentation is he also gave one behind the wall, so I don't have a screenshot for you, but an example of where they kind of, on that spectrum, went more towards explanation, and they were doing a set of, I think, messy data, survey data, where they walked people through it, but also built in a little bit of exploration. So, you know, here are the strong points of the data. Here are the kind of opportunities, weaknesses, uh, you know, good news, bad news of the data, kind of laying it out for people to help get them to walk through it, see the story, but then allowing them also a little bit of exploration within each of those kind of areas. So again, spectrum, you choose kind of where you want to play. If you really want to go much farther on the explanation side, what I'm showing you is an example of a, of a survey report from incoming first-year students, um, about 200 students. You know, what are, what are the top five issues that incoming first-year, first-time students had? Uh, this is a sample campus um, so that you have some idea. But I mean, talk about curating the data. Talk about kind of laying out for folks. Um, if you know MapWorks, that's where this comes from. There are probably, depending on how many questions a campus chooses or not chooses, there can be 100 questions on this survey. There can be 20 different kinds of factors or sets of questions and, and in essence what we did kind of as we created this report is we had folks tell us just tell me the top five issues for my students I don't want to dig through I don't want to look through the data I don't want to do all of that I need to know the top five issues so I can start putting resources programs and people in place to deal with those immediately for the students who have walked through my door and so what you can see here is you can see things like test anxiety low time management skills uh, satisfaction with the institution that's how I know this is kind of um, sample data because that's really really high and not something we typically see but low academic integration I don't feel like I'm I'm fit uh, I fit in kind of to classes in that academic environment on campus or uh, low environment on campus, so I'm not 
happy, I can't study in my room, I can't sleep in my room, things are happening. And you can imagine, as somebody who doesn't want to dig through data, who is very focused on creating support for students, this tells me where to start, right? So kind of that spectrum. All right, let's do another one of these kind of perspectives. Spectrum was one. The next thing I want to talk about is some goals related to data visualizations, but I would say also sharing of data. Um, and this is another place where you don't pick one of the three goals. You kind of have a, um, you maybe have a primary goal and a secondary goal, or I don't know what you're doing. But the dilemma with these three goals that we're going to talk about is they do sometimes compete, and you'll see what I mean. So let's start with what the three goals are. Um, this is coming from a book. I'll show you the reference in just a second. But if you think about the goal of data visualizations, one of them is appeal. How much does it draw me in? How exciting looking is it? Does it make me want to read or pay attention or look? Um, and I think we've all seen those reports that lack appeal. And hopefully, we've all seen reports or data sharing that have high levels of appeal. But appeal is that sort of, I don't know, engagement with the audience, uh, the motivating people to pay attention um, and, and to, I don't know, look at things, right? So appeal. One of them is comprehension. How much do you want people to understand the data? How much do they need to understand the data? Um, and, and, and make sense of what it is and what it means. And maybe even in some cases for some audiences, how collected, how well can they apply it to the students that they're working with? So comprehension is all about understanding and wanting that audience to understand to the level of which they need to understand to do something with the information, even to trust the information. Okay, So that can be another goal, is, is how much do they need to I don't know, believe it, trust it, understand it, make sense of it, and how much uh, do we need to provide in whatever visualization we're using so they can do that. And the third one is retention, meaning how much are they going to remember it? Remember it in 20 minutes, remember it in an hour, remember it in a couple of years. Uh, for me, it, the retention one goes back sometimes to that storytelling element. Sometimes those stories stick with me much, uh, like in stronger ways than a data point might. And so if my goal is retention, the way I'm going to frame up data visualization may be very different. If I really need people to remember the the not only just what the data said, but what they should do with it, I'm going to frame a very different data visualization uh, than I might for an audience who's going to be very focused on comprehension. Right? So again, these you don't pick one of these, but you hopefully can start to see where if my focus is appeal, comprehension might kind of I don't know if balance, but tug on that. Is if it should be appealing, then a method section from a journal article is not going to help build my appeal for most audiences, right? So this kind of push and pull among these three. Um, in the book that we kind of got these ideas from, Lanco, Crux, and Ritchie, and again, resources will be at the end, they kind of talked about three different broad areas where we're doing visualizations, not just an assessment, but sort of broadly wide. Um, and they talked about where the push and pulls are. And so if you think about it, like academic scientific data visualizations, one of the big priorities is comprehension because you want those audiences to understand what you've done, how you've created it, what it means, and that's what those audiences are motivated uh, to do when they hit data visualizations or sharing of data. Um, on the flip side, if you think about something like marketing, the primary goal is likely appeal. You want somebody to pay attention. You want to get through that information overload so that they look at that data visualization and then hopefully retain something because you want them uh, to pay attention and remember it. Right? Um, and I don't mean marketing just in the sense of marketing and sales, but if you think about it, this plays for us on campuses. You know, some of the data sharing and assessment data visualizations that we put together need a marketing element. I need to 
have the appeal to engage uh, and particularly maybe an external audience or an audience that isn't deeply involved in the data that I'm talking about. So maybe it's a different department on campus that I'm talking to. Um, or maybe it's folks that frankly aren't super focused on the topic I'm talking about. I might need to up my appeal. So I may play with some of these marketing kinds of notions. Um, so don't get caught on that word marketing, I guess is my point. <laughs> and then the third one that they talk about is editorial content. And I, I don't know, I, I've, I've been working, you know, in the company for a little while, and this is where you start talking about, you know, thought leadership content or contributions to the field, but also sort of contributions to our other professionals in the field. Um, that, to me, is where some of the editorial work that we do with data visualizations comes in. I do need to have appeal. I need to engage people with this information. But suddenly now comprehension is going to become a bigger issue because I want them to understand what we've done and what it means, uh, and maybe even how to apply it, but at least get them focused on it so that if they have to do the application, they're in there enough to be able to do that. So think about those three concepts when you think about your own visuals. Let me show you a, a concrete kind of piece. This is some data from a nursing survey. It's actually a nursing exit survey. So, you know, think of students who have earned a bachelor's or are earning, I guess, a bachelor's degree in nursing, um, and they're in their last semester. And we've asked them uh, some information. This comes from actually one of our own surveys. So, 86% of the respondents are full time. You've got part time, female, male, first generation. You've also got this notion of how far away from this institution are they seeking employment? Are they trying to find local employment or kind of um, broader employment? Um, so some interesting data points. This clearly is not a great visual because it's, I don't know, just a PowerPoint slide with some numbers. Um, so what I want to show you is some things that we did with it. Um, this is actually a infographic. You're seeing a piece of it uh, that our marketing department did for us. Um, and what I want you to see real quickly is if you think about those things, appeal, retention, comprehension, this is definitely high-level appeal. Talk about graphics and visuals and fast and furious. Um, if you think about, too, retention, 49%, so half of the students are seeking a job within 30 miles of a nursing program. That can be kind of a good piece of information for us to understand that we are um, in essence, with our graduates serving the local community. Um, this is national data, but campuses would obviously look at their own. 94% of the grads want to work in a hospital. Wow, OK, that's kind of interesting. So now we've got appeal and we've got retention. Um, I say low level of comprehension because at some level, don't forget, I gave you some of the kind of who took the survey and kind of when. But you don't have a lot of information about that, and you don't have a lot of information about the alternative responses that may or may not be showing here. But again, this is sort of marketing high level, getting some data out there that people might pay attention to. So three kinds of levels of things and, and, and the results of that. Here's another piece. I like this little piece from the same infographic. Um, how quickly are they getting hired? 41% have a full-time position at graduation. That's a really kind of powerful piece of information. Look at how like appealing and fast it is. Look at how the images fit with, you know, nursing grads. Um, yeah, this is fast, furious kind of getting information out there, getting people thinking. Um, and, and that sort of notion of, wow, they really are getting hired quickly, right? Again. Not a lot of kind of comprehension depth built here, but that's not the purpose of what was trying to be done, right? Okay. So we've done perspective, explanation, exploration. We've done sort of three goals. Um, I want to give you one more kind of set of things to be thinking about as you put together visuals or as you evaluate visuals or think about visuals or whatever it might be. And this is where we're going to push um, OK, I hate this phrase. I'm going to use it anyway. Push the envelope a little bit. Um, you know, and this uh, 
this perspective came about, frankly, because I am an amateur artist. And one of the things that struck me as I uh, have developed uh, some more kind of painting skills and things were that artists have this whole set of tools that they use. Um, and also designers have this whole set of tools that they use, concepts and other things. And I think for those of us who are non-professionals, um, we stumble upon some of them. Uh, we use all of these tools, whether we mean to or not. And um, I just wanted to kind of bring them to the forefront because sometimes we're not using them well. Sometimes we're not even aware that we are using them. And sometimes we're not using them when we could be. So I want to talk about what those kinds of artist and design tools are that they use when they're creating visuals. Um, so I guess my artist perspective is a little bit narrow in that we're talking uh, primarily about kind of visual artists. But you'll get it. If you think about some of the big principles that an artist uses, I hear some of them. So let's talk through them a little bit. And what I want you to be thinking about as we talk through them is the story you're trying to communicate with your data and how these might help you do that. Okay? So like the first one is unity and harmony. As you look at an image, you know, unity and harmony create a tone, a, a, a response, and help tell a particular story. Um, you can also flip it. You can have uh, disunity, uh, I don't know, unharmony, that's not quite the word. But you know what I mean, that, that notion of, of, of kind of contrast, which is actually the last one, but that notion of, of, of kind of different images. And so by creating a visual that has harmony, we are kind of laying some groundwork for the tone, right? Um, we can use things like balance or imbalance. Um, so that, and, and some of this we do naturally. When we create a graph, sometimes we're working on balance, particularly if the message we're trying to say is uh, something like, look, our students are learning across a wide variety of areas. That can be told with a visual and a tool of balance. We want the balance to show, right? Hierarchies, putting together hierarchies of visuals. Eve, um, and, and I always think of this in two different ways. I think we naturally do some hierarchies when we sort data in a table putting the high uh, on one side and the low levels on the other and kind of creating that kind of hierarchy. But there's also a hierarchy design principle that's about, you know, putting big things first and kind of uh, think about online systems and drill down to smaller pieces second and kind of building those hierarchies, those structures that help people think through things, right? Scale and proportion. Um, there's some great books, and hopefully you all have seen them, you know, how to lie with statistics, how to lie with charts. One of the big ways that people can kind of lie with charts is messing with scales and proportions. But we can also use scales and proportions in our visuals to draw attention, to highlight things, to emphasize things. Um, we can use dominance. Uh, emphasis, images that, um, you know, this one's really big on the page, so it draws the most attention. Um, or similarity and contrast. So if things are kind of uniform, that creates one kind of message. Whereas, uh, and we've all seen the charts where, you know, you, you make one, one of the bars red, so you've got that contrast to draw attention and, and make a point, right? Um, I have to show you one thing just because it made me laugh. When I was looking through this list of kind of design principles, scale and proportion um, I, is one of the ones that struck me because as a data person, I expect the scale and proportion to match the data. And that may or may not be true depending on the goal. If the goal is comprehension, it probably better be. If the goal is appeal, maybe not. So I'm going to flip back because I want you to see this one. This one kills me. When I think about scale and proportion and comprehension, 86% of full-time students and 42% are first-generation students, those scale and proportion are the same. But the data is not the same. But if you think about the goal being appeal, that kind of uniformity, that harmony, makes this easier to read. If my goal was comprehension, that uniformity and harmony is sending probably the wrong message. So do you see how these concepts can start helping you think through different things? And, and these tools of scale and proportion, balance, hierarchy, are things 
that we are naturally using. What we don't often think through is what does it mean when we use them? Because I don't know that we're using them purposefully. Um, these are the design principles. So these are the kinds of things that you kind of put together to create and craft a visual message. Um, but there's different tools that you use to do that. So if you want to create balance, what you might use are different tools for different elements. Color balance, shape balance, texture balance. So we'll go through those um, in, in just a sec. But keep in mind that these are the bigger sort of design principles by which we should kind of match a story. So I think on the side you see, you know, which principle best fits the story that you're trying to tell. Are you trying to tell a story of balance or imbalance? Are you trying to create some dominance or emphasis on one particular kind of message? And then how do we do that kind of visually, right? Um, also think about if you have the story ahead of time, which of these design principles would be useful? If you're trying to tell a story of strengths and weaknesses, you can use design principles like hierarchies to show kind of the range and motion of things. Or you can use something like similarity and contrast to show the differences between our strengths and weaknesses. Make sense? Okay, so hopefully these visual toolbox items are things that I don't know, I, at least for me personally, there are things I've been looking at for a long time. Um, and there's some great little pieces out there if you search on the web. But I mean, think about it, proximity. proximity. You put things together near each other, then people naturally start to compare or look at them together. Similar things we assume are similar, dissimilar things we think are dissimilar. Um, we put an enclosure around a bar to show and draw attention to it. Uh, maybe we put a closure around a box to kind of separate it from other messages, right? Continuity of things. That can be a way to kind of get people through. If we use a chart in one place, maybe we provide some continuity by using similar charts to speed up the visual processing as you hit subsequent charts. Right? Making connections among different things. And then again, what lines, colors, shapes, textures, space. I mean, for a long time there, it was a don't use white space or be careful of your white space. Um, I, you know, in art terms, it's negative space. But there is that kind of balance of where do we put negative space and why. Um, and it's not just where it happens to fall on the page, but being purposeful about those choices, uh, let alone the forms we use. I don't know about you, but like in those early conversations about which charts and graphs to use um, and why, we were also having at some level, and I'm sorry to say this because I know I was in some of those conversations, we were having some dumb conversations about what texture should different bar charts be, you know, and if we use this texture here, what should we use for the other one? Should we just use shading or should we add texture? So at some level, we hit some of this. I'm not sure how well we hit it because we framed it all in this conversation of a chart, kind of bypassing whether a chart was the right piece. We're doing some of that right now with the online interactive stuff, but uh, we're not doing textures because we all kind of got sick of all those horrible textures, and we're doing more conversations about colors. But I think there's some bigger conversations to have rather than just are we choosing the right colors? Are these the colors of our institution? Are these colors um, appropriate for all the different audiences we may serve in terms of uh, colorblind and other issues? I, I think in addition to that conversation, we need to have another conversation, which is, is color the tool that we want to use to create whatever kind of story and principle that we're playing on? Sorry, I had to take a breath. Whew. Um, and by the way, you're using those tools whether you realize it or not. You may be putting a box around uh, a section of a chart on a PowerPoint or not putting a box around it. Uh, you may be uh, creating kinds of things next to each other so they start to blend or not next to each other so they don't. Um, so kind of thinking through some of this can be pretty interesting. So let me show you another example. This is retention data. Actually, what I'm showing you right here is uh, survey data, not retention, but I'll get to the retention in a second. This is new, first-time, um, full-time 
first year students coming into a campus three to five weeks in, MapWorks data. Um, I, you know, to what degree are you committed to completing a degree, uh, committed to completing a degree at this institution, returning for the spring term, returning for next year. Um, I, you know, a couple of things to note is that there's no question these are highly skewed um, to the kind of right as you look at it to that you know kind of positive side of things um, of course you know when you're talking about and this is predominantly four-year campuses when you're talking about four-year campuses students come to us uh, with the intention of getting a degree um, returning next fall um, and, and in many cases being at this institution so none of this should surprise you you can imagine this is one way to present data and for some audiences this is probably what they might want um, the overall message or story of that data is students plan to stay students have you know strong goals students plan to complete a degree however you want to frame that but it is sort of a positive kind of message you could also craft a message that says hey they're committed to a degree but there is a little bit of thinking about here although it's still highly skewed there's like nobody sitting in these lower numbers so um, another set that goes with it is uh, when you look at this particular set of students, 87% of them did come back in the spring semester, so we're re-enrolled at the same institution in, um, in sort of that January, February period, 13% were not. Average GPA, 277. Average credit earned, 12.4. Um, and one of the interesting things is if you look at whether they plan to come back, um, a, and whether or not, so this is taking that seven point scale, putting the ones and twos here, three, fours, fives here, and the high intent is six and seven, so obviously this group is huge, um, and looking at whether they did come back, there's a clear relationship between the two. If I plan to come back, I'm much more likely to come back. And if I don't plan to come back, I'm much less likely to come back. But keep in mind, one in two is 1% of students, 2% of students, tiny little group who's got kind of a 50-50 shot at coming back in this data set. So think about the story you might tell with this data. Right? You've got the, hey, they have strong plans. Uh, you've got the relationship between the plan and whether they come back. You've got uh, actually 87% uh, retention rate from fall to spring, so that's pretty strong. You've got a, a decent kind of GPA kind of look at things overall. You've got a number of different stories you could tell. So imagine you're the artist and you're going to tell it in an artist style, not the tables that you've just seen where I have to explain to you what you kind of see, or, or I felt like I did before I started doing the, uh, the uh, artist perspective. Imagine you're telling an audience who, if you go back to that early spectrum, exploration versus explanation, they want you to just tell me, explain it to me. We want to do a high level of appeal comprehension, yeah, but we want high appeal, we probably want high retention, we want to, from a storytelling response, evoke a response in an audience, okay? So kind of that laid out, how would you put this together, what kind of tools would you use? Um, look at something like that, 1% of college students intend to leave. So here's that first message, look, they're coming to us, they plan to be here. It's the isolated student who's planning to leave. If you think about the design principles here, talk about the message matching the image. Isolation, kind of the tone, the color, the, the, the kind of um, texture of this whole slide is designed to evoke a response, right? 1% of college students intend to leave. Here's another one. You may have seen this image before. I think uh, many of us use it in a variety of places. But look at this, another 7% are considering leaving. Again, these numbers are fairly low, but through the visuals, we start talking about this kind of potential problem. Right, this this kind of emotional response of people thinking about leaving. Let's see if we can get people to retain, to appeal. Notice um, there's no response rates. There's no there's no data sitting here except for this kind of high level piece. Um, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Um, remember, I did give you the percentage who leave and that kind of thing. So we've been laying out a story: one percent uh, planning to leave, seven percent are thinking about it. But really, when we think about retention, 
And as an image, as an artist, think of this, harmony, uniformity, those kinds of images. Also think about it from a storytelling image. This image is an image that's familiar to most people with college campuses. And on many campuses, this is an iconic image, particularly if you have a, uh, a strong uh, kind of football athletic presence on your campus. This is an image that speaks to you, right? Um, so when we think about retention, that's what we lose. So think about it, two stands of students gone after one semester. Think about the emotional impact of that. Also think about, yeah, an iconic image that plays, that people understand, they can think about what two stands look like. Um, the other thing that I think is hilarious is I honestly did count the number of stands to try and figure out what would be about the right set of stands to do 13%. So there is a an element of, of data accuracy as much as you can do with football stadium behind the scenes. But the idea, obviously, is not about comprehension. It is truly about retention and getting that response and getting people to understand what it means for our campus to have what sounds like a very high, high retention rate of 87. This is what it means. This is what we lose, right? And then ending kind of this storytelling approach with a call to action. So that the yes, the focus is on appeal, um, but the focus is on retention and and moving people. What are we going to do about it? Because two stands is probably not acceptable from an emotional perspective, right? So wow, how is that for an artist kind of piece of things? Um, now let's be real clear that artist approach would definitely not work for audiences who are very interested in comprehension, who are very interested in exploring the data, who are interested, frankly, in the numbers, because we didn't the numbers. So this is really often about matching the data visualization to the audience. And so that's kind of one of the things I want to talk about when we talk about wrapping this up, is when you think about the spectrum of exploration to explanation, there's a lot of places we could end up on this spectrum um, at the highest level of kind of a sharing a report piece and at the lowest level. And there's ways to have the same set of data have different kinds of visuals to fall at different places on the spectrum. But it's about understanding how much people want you to, to have done the work for them and curated the data and the analysis and tell me what's important versus, you know what, I really have my own questions and I want to explore. And I have the um, experience and with not only the concepts but the data to do that kind of exploration and kind of feeding that in. What is the goal that you're trying to do? Is it engaging people, appealing to them, getting their attention and holding their attention? Or is it about comprehension and getting them to understand and make sense of and trust and, and pay attention to the data? Or is it about retention and getting them to remember it so it impacts their practice? Because fundamentally, if you're trying to do all of these in one visual, it's not likely you're going to succeed. Because comprehension is often, as I said, not appealing. Um, and comprehension is often not something we retain unless it's something that we're already well engaged in. right? Um, and so it does come down to kind of audience and what do they want, what do they need, what are their interests and motivations about this data and this stuff that you're kind of sharing with them. And finally, you know, where can we use an artist approach? Maybe not as far as I went with the PowerPoint slides I showed you, but you know, even on those kind of interactive exploration data visual pages that we're creating, you know, can we use some of these tools in thoughtful, deliberate, purposeful ways um, and maybe use them better? Because chances are we're using them anyway. We're creating pages with buttons and, and, and graphs and other things. And, and, and how are we doing on that? Again, not that every visual we do needs to have this level of thinking, but there are definitely places uh, where we need to be super thoughtful and other places where we can say, you know what, colors aren't important, let's go with the campus colors. Those are, those are critical. Um, but knowing where we're making those trade-offs can be really important as we think through things. Um, 
So use some of these tools to evaluate, improve, and think about visuals um, as time and effort allows. Right? Um, and, and frankly, as function and priority allow. Some of the data sharing that we do is not as critical as others. So kind of putting those priorities in place. Here's some of the references. Um, obviously, I think we've read tons. But these are kind of the ones that were big in the stuff that um, I've shown you. Um, and I'm going to point to Kinsley in just a second. But a couple things. Um, if you want to continue conversations, I am on LinkedIn. I encourage you to uh, connect up. Uh, typically, if we're doing these kinds of educational webinars, I try to post them on LinkedIn uh, so that you know it's coming. Um, that can be a way for you to spot it. Um, we're also doing some blogs and research notes and other things. And so I've been getting better about posting those on LinkedIn as well so that you can see them. You don't have to check in all the time. Uh, they should show up in your feed. So feel free to do that. Um, but if you want to, go ahead and check our website. Um, there are the webinars. They're on the calendar of upcoming events. Um, and the one that's coming up next month is about first-year students and so uh, those kind of first-time first-year students and and what are we learning about them through some of the data uh, but also on the website as I said we have blogs we do have infographics I showed you a couple of pieces from a nursing one but we have them about all kinds of different stuff uh, whether it's first-year students and student success or housing or nursing or different kinds of student leaders and unions and all kinds of stuff we've even got some infographics about assessment and about assessment strategies or assessment techniques, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, there's other educational content. There's research notes, I think, under the research section. So look at those. Um, and yeah, there's the, the, web, or the next webinar. Feel free to take a look at that. Here's a couple pages about us. Um, in case you don't know Sky Factor, formerly EBI, um, obviously we're uh, committed to helping improve um, college students and, and colleges and university programs uh, to improve retention, success, quality of the student experience, uh, lots of software systems and, and, and some really strong kind of research based and rigorously tested content. What we did today was kind of more conceptual because it's important to us to kind of contribute back to the field. Uh, but we do have impeccable client services and support as folks work through some of these things. On the two sides of the house, we do have MapWorks, which I alluded to briefly, which is a student success and retention system, um, helping campuses really um, use predictive analytics to identify students early, um, develop critical insights, and make a difference for those students. Uh, again, research-based, tested, all kinds of things. On the bench work side are those program assessments. So you saw some stuff from uh, a nursing assessment, uh, but we have a whole wide variety of those. And that system not only does and provides the assessment content, but a whole host of uh, reporting, benchmarking, longitudinal, uh, mapping to professional and accreditation standards, all kinds of stuff. Um, there's our website. So Ms. Kinsley, do we have any questions or points to talk about? Hey, Sherry. Uh, not right now. I don't see anything. That was great. Fast and furious, lots of things. Hopefully, y'all are thinking. Um, and that's the idea. I think if we had done a, you know, how to do visuals in Excel, um, that, that while extremely helpful, may not apply if you're not using Excel. So our goal was to use some concepts that you could use regardless of what tool you're using and, frankly, regardless of what mechanism you're using to kind of um, create visuals or share data. Um, just get you thinking. Anything else? Last call. Quiet group. Quiet group. Sharon says those, those were great points. So, Cool. Thank you, Sharon. I hope you all have a wonderful day. And uh, if you have a question that comes up later, just reach out and we'll see what we can do in terms of responding via email or some other way. But wow, we ended about eight minutes early. We did great today. Yay. So. Yep. Yeah, I think we're good. Nothing else, Kinsley? Um, OK. Thanks, guys. Have Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh no! I just wanted to let everybody know in our follow-up email, you can also you'll also have access to the presentation slides. So perfect. That will help with the reference list, I'm sure. <laughs> so thanks, Kinsley. Everybody have a great day uh, and a and a wonderful uh, what July hot and humid day for most of us. So.
All right. Thanks, Sherry. Bye.